Please take your Bibles and turn back to that passage of Scripture we read just a moment ago. We're in the book of Exodus, chapter 14. Today, the Lord willing, we're beginning a new series of messages, Mouth of the Gorges, part one. Now, you know, when I have a part one, there's going to be a part two, the Lord willing, if God lets me live. And uh, I hope you will see why as we get into this text before us. Here we find the children of Israel heading out, moving quickly. Passover has taken place back in chapter 12. We find God giving various instructions to the children of Israel, them packing up everything that they need for the journey, having to do it very quickly, the institution of the very first Passover. And now we find them actually moving out. They're turning, going a different direction now, going toward a place called Pihahirot. It's between Migdal and the sea. It's over against some other place called Baal Tzifon, and they're going to encamp right next to the sea. And that's going to give Pharaoh the encouragement to pursue after them. What is so tempting to Pharaoh because of the location of the children of Israel? What we're getting into right now in this particular part of the text is just exactly where did the Red Sea crossing take place? There have been a lot of different theories about it, and a lot of people simply ignore the text. We had a gentleman here some time ago who ignored some of these things that are in the text, wanted to put it at a totally different location. The liberals put it way up in the north. They put it where the children of Israel are marching, marching through the marshlands and the swamplands uh, up along the, the northern borders of the Gulf of Suez. And then Pharaoh's chariot's getting stuck in the mud. I can remember as a child, my dad was a pastor at that time in a very liberal denomination. And um, that was what they said in the Sunday school literature. That, well, the reason the children of Israel were able to escape was because they were traveling light and Pharaoh's chariots weighed a lot and they got stuck in the mud and so the Israelites got away. <laughs> That's not exactly the description of the miracle that takes place in the text as we're going to discover when we get a little farther and see some other very exciting words later on when Pharaoh's chariots get swallowed up. But um, tonight, or this morning rather, Mouth of the Gorges, part one. Now let me give you a quick summary from last week because it's necessary for us to see what is taking place here. We've been talking about the second aspect of sanctification being spiritual warfare and the New Testament uses the warfare of Israel to illustrate spiritual warfare. We saw that it was expressed by three different key words used in the New Testament in relation to what's called progressive sanctification. Number one, serving, that is serving the King of Kings with our gifts, talents, and testimony as the world watches us. Number two, walking by patient, obedient faith, not by sight, we don't know the future. Israel had to walk by faith. They learned to obey God's rules when everything seemed to be impossible. We'll see one of those very impossible situations coming up as they cut across the Red Sea. Number three, growing. Serving, walking, and growing in holiness and purity so that we will reflect God rather than being soiled by the world, the flesh, the devil, and the demons. We saw Paul explain the armor and weapons of spiritual warfare in Ephesians 6. We saw how powerful our spiritual enemies really are by looking at passages in Daniel, Jude, and Revelation. We summarize the four steps to practical sanctification, the aspect of sanctification that relates to our experience in this world. The four steps to progressive, practical, experiential sanctification being, it begins with salvation, where you get your positional sanctification, and that starts your new walk as a Christian. That was Ephesians 1. It should be followed, number two, shortly thereafter, when the believer presents his body as a living sacrifice to Christ to be used for God's design purposes and not for the flesh. That's Romans 12, 1 and 2. Three, it continues and grows as the believer studies the Bible and walks by obedient faith. Ah, how important that is. According to the word of God, Jesus said, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Practical progressive sanctification is contingent upon the regular daily intake of the word of God. There is no experience of progressive sanctification without studying the Bible. Jesus said, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. You can't do it without the word of God. Number four, it is hindered by sin, and it gets back on track when we confess our sins. Very important four steps to progressive sanctification. That's what we're living right now in this world as God works on us to burn the drudge and the dross and the waste products out of our lives to conform us to the image of Christ. 
Now, you don't get perfect in this life. Charismatics tell you that you can get perfect in this life. That doesn't happen. You're going to be fighting a warfare all the time you're here. You're always going to be doing battle with the flesh. You do not get rid of the flesh until you step into glory, which is ultimate sanctification, which we talked about last week as well. We saw that there are three English words in the Bible that directly speak to the doctrine of sanctification. All come from the same Hebrew and Greek roots. Those words are holy, saint, and sanctify, and they're related words, such as holiness and sanctification. We saw that people and things can be holy. For example, we started with God himself. God is holy because that's the nature of his being. We saw that the Father sanctified the Son. That was John 10, 36. We saw a thing may be holy because of its relationship to God, such as the tabernacle was a holy place, and it had a holy of holies in it. We saw that God also sanctified days. For example, he sanctified the, the feast days and the Sabbath days in the Old Testament. We saw people who have a special relationship to God are also called holy. And those who are called a holy nation, the holy brethren, and so on. That's positional sanctification. We saw that positional sanctification is closely connected with the doctrines of imputation and justification. Quick summary. I hope you understand the difference. It's why it makes you a Protestant and not a Roman Catholic. The difference between imputation and justification. Imputation is when we are made righteous. We're made holy in the sight of God. That's imputation. God transfers some things from Christ's account to ours and our sins from our account to Christ's account. That transfer, logizomai, that is the transfer of our sins to Christ and divine righteousness to our account when we believe. That's imputation. That's where we are made righteous. Justification deals with being declared righteous, not made righteous, declared righteous. We are declared righteous in the sight of God by faith alone. Get that? Carefully, we are declared righteous in the sight of God by faith alone. But we are declared righteous in the sight of men by our works. That's what James is talking about. What people can see us doing since they can't see the faith that is inside of us. Here's something I haven't given you before if you want to write it down on those little note sheets that you've got there. An easy way to remember the distinction when we're talking about justification by faith alone. That's something invisible. Invisible salvation is once for all. Justification by faith alone. Invisible salvation is once for all. Justification by works. That's something different. Visible sanctification is repeatable. With salvation once and for all, but visible sanctification is repeatable. That's justification by works. That emphasizes for us the self-evident truth that no doctrine of Scripture stands alone. If we fail to integrate Scripture, it results in doctrinal perversion. Every doctrine provides a balance with all other Bible doctrines. If you interpret any doctrine in a way that twists other Bible doctrines, you know that your interpretation is wrong. The doctrine of sanctification has been perverted by Rome with the canonization of the uh, saints. They are making them into saints. That's a perversion of the doctrine of sanctification. Charismatics pervert it with tongues being the proof of either salvation or spirituality. Pentecostals have a similar application. Holiness movement groups claim sinless perfection can be achieved in this life. And as a result, all other doctrines such as imputation and justification are damaged. Folks, what you make the foundation of your faith is going to affect the way you live and it's going to affect every other doctrine you believe if you are consistent, and I hope you are consistent, with a solid foundation. A clear understanding of sanctification and true meaning of setting apart is essential to understanding, for example, all these different verses. We gave a whole bunch of different illustrations. How man can sanctify God, that's 1 Peter 3.15. Man can sanctify himself, that's like the Nazarite vow. Man can sanctify other people. The unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife. The unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean. Paul uses the same words there. One thing can sanctify another. Jesus talked about that. Whether it's greater the gold or the temple that sanctifieth the gold and so on. In relation to people, God also sanctified the priests and people of Israel and Israel as a nation. That's Exodus 29. And we saw that angels can either be holy or unholy. That is, set apart angels for God's purposes are those which are unholy. That is, the ones who have rebelled against God. That brought us to the second self-evident truth that the function of the Bible is to interpret experience rather than having experience interpret the Bible. A person can have a genuine experience that is not a biblical experience. The world, the flesh, the devil, and the demons also produce supernatural experiences. They always are counterfeits. Being supernatural does not mean that it is from God. It just means that you're involved in a spiritual warfare. You better determine who are the, the quizzlings in your midst, who are the spies in your midst, who are the ones who are trying to undermine your spiritual life. 
And the only test that you have is the Word of God. So make sure it conforms to the Word of God because if it does not conform to the Word of God, it's wrong. This is the touchstone, not experience. You say you had an experience, so what? The question is, does your experience line up with what the Word of God declares to be the truth? We saw there are eight means of sanctification that God uses in the life of the believer, stated so in many different passages, by union with Christ, 1 Corinthians 1, 2, by the word of God, sanctified by the word of God, uh, 1 Timothy 4, 5, by the blood of Christ, Hebrews 13, 12, by the body of Christ, Hebrews 10, 10, by the cross, Galatians 6, 14, by the Holy Spirit, 2 Thessalonians 2, 13, 1 Peter 1, 2, by individual choice, Hebrews 12, 14, and by faith, Acts 26, 18. Sanctification is also by faith, not merely salvation by faith. We are sanctified by faith according to the Apostle Paul in Acts 26, 18. People are also commanded to be holy and to live holy lives because God is by his nature of being holy. Be ye holy for I the Lord your God am holy. That's out of Leviticus 11, 44. But Peter quotes it in 1 Peter 1, 16 showing that that is a transdispensational principle that still applies to us today. Now I want you to notice two things. I haven't given you this before so if you're taking notes, here it is. Note well, God commanded us to be holy. In the New Testament, God never gives a command without giving the power to fulfill the command. That's in the New Testament. In the New Testament, God never gives a command without giving the power to fulfill the command. That is essential. That means that everything that God commands you to do, he will give you the power to do it. He doesn't sit there and laugh as you stumble around and can't do it. But that's New Testament. In the New Testament, God never gives a command without giving the power to fulfill the command. But there's a contrast. In the Old Testament, God gave commands, but he didn't give them with the power to fulfill them. He gave the commands to prove that the people of God could not fulfill the commands without him. In the Old Testament, God gave commands to prove that the people could not fulfill the commands without him. You go through that list of the Ten Commandments. How many of them have you broken? Remember Jesus said, for example, if a man lusts after a woman in his heart, he's already committed adultery with her. You don't have to do the physical act. If you hate somebody, you've committed murder. Ever done that? Ever coveted anything? You've committed idolatry. Paul says so in Colossians 3, 5 and Ephesians 5, 5. Covetousness is idolatry and the covetous man is an idolater. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make any graven images to bow down unto them. Bro broken command number one and command number two. You see, in the Old Testament, God gave commands they could not fulfill to prove they could not fulfill them, that they needed someone to save them and that's why Jesus came. The law will never save you. Law keeping will never get you to heaven. It will not sanctify you. You are sanctified by faith just like you are saved by faith. And it's all a matter of the grace and gift of God. We saw that the term saint or saints is used about 50 times of Israel in the Old Testament, 62 times in the New Testament of believers today. And being a saint does not guarantee a super spiritual quality of life. It doesn't guarantee a trouble-free life of material goods and blessings. It does not is not proven by you doing graveside miracles and being canonized by the Pope. None of that stuff is in the New Testament. That brought us to the final stage of the doctrine of sanctification, which is ultimate sanctification. The final division of sanctification is ultimate sanctification that happens to each Christian when that person goes home to heaven to be with the Savior. It could be through death. It could be through the rapture of the church. It describes the moment when we are perfectly reflecting Jesus Christ. And we gave you many references to that. First John chapter 3, Romans chapter 8, and so on. We saw that we are going to be conformed to the image of Christ. That is, we will be reflecting perfectly the original, the Lord Jesus Christ. Progressive sanctification, ultimate sanctification are confused by holiness groups and historic Pentecostals. They try to teach the person to be sinlessly perfect in this life before standing before Christ or at the rapture. Paul expressed it in terms of the marriage relationship between husband and wife, and he explains the job of the husband in that context. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. That he might, ah, here it is, Jesus is involved in sanctification. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy 
There we go back to our root word again, hagios, holy and without blemish. We saw that all three members of the Trinity are actually involved in sanctification. God the Father is involved in sanctification. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 and 24, the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. We find Jude 1, 1, we are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. We saw God the Son is involved in sanctification. We just read you a verse out of Ephesians just a second ago. We see Jesus, he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one. Or Hebrews 9, chapter, 13, uh, chapter 9, verses 13 and 14. How if the blood of bulls and goats sanctifieth the purifying of the, flet, purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ? Shall the blood of Christ do what? Sanctify. Hebrews 13, 11 and 12. Wherefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. We saw that the Holy Spirit, the third member of the Trinity, is also involved in sanctification. Romans chapter 15, 16, the last phrase says, being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. 1 Corinthians 6, 11 says, speaking of the Spirit of God, it says, but you are sanctified you are by the Spirit of our God. 2 Thessalonians 2, 13, through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. I hope you get that. All three members of the Godhead were involved in your sanctification. That's how important it is. Positionally, practically, and ultimately, the three stages of sanctification. Your position in Christ. Your daily walk as God transforms you. Your ultimate sanctification when you stand without blemish in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ. All three members of the Trinity are involved in that. Last week we gave you three startling and striking illustrations of ultimate sanctification in the recent deaths of Walter Platt, Paul Hafner, and Jessica Wren. They all knew the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. They're all now rejoicing in perfect health in heaven. They have all received the final gift of ultimate sanctification. But folks, for us, they're all dead. No more life in this world, no more ministering to family and friends, no more opportunity for heavenly rewards. This life is over. And then I reminded myself, not just you, that I and you are personally going to stand before God, perhaps before the end of the week is over. I hope you feel every day death is at the door. I asked a sobering question. Are you ready to give a full account for the deeds done in this body? Or are you living in the flesh and coveting, lusting and complaining about this life and telling God what you want instead of asking him what he wants? What are you doing with the few remaining days of your life anyway? We saw Paul speaking of ultimate sanctification in the New Testament, 2 Corinthians 5, 8. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore, we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive for the things done in this body, according to that he hath done, whether good or bad. Oh, listen to these next words. I hope you get them. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord. We persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. Romans 14, 12, So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. First Peter 4, 5, Who shall give account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead? It's all over the New Testament. Someday the Christian will be presented faultless before the presence of God. We know that. Ephesians 1, 4 says so. Jude 1, 24 says so. But ultimate sanctification requires the death of our current bodies, which were made subject to the curse because of Adam's sin. Those bodies are affected by weakness, age, sickness, illness, injury, disease, death, and decay. God has promised, and he's proved it through the resurrection of Christ, that death is not the end. He guarantees to give us a resurrection body that will no longer be affected by the curse and no longer subjected to these things. That's 1 Corinthians 15. And so we concluded with the summary, the way of the wilderness requires both times of testing to burn out our fleshly desires, and the way of the wilderness also requires times of battle in the spiritual warfare of life. And we desire that every one of you to show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end, that you be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. 
Now, we've just read that exciting section in chapter 14, verses 1 through 9. So there's all new material from this point. Before moving into the next section, I want to pick up a few loose ends that I didn't answer in the preceding text. First, did you notice verse 19 in our preceding text? It said, And Moses took the bones of Joseph with him. For he had straightly sworn the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and ye shall carry up my bones away hence with you. That took place more than 400 years before. But Joseph knew that God always keeps his promises. And Joseph proved it by the last command that he gave to the children of Israel. His dying words were proof of his faith. You know, some time ago I read a very interesting article that listed the last words of a number of famous infidels and the last words of a number of famous believers. And in the last words of the famous believers, you have this magnificent joy, the declaration that they're about to step into heaven in the presence of Jesus. You read the last words of the infidels, and they're all cries and screams of despair. They have no hope. And some of them actually realized they'd made the wrong choice. Joseph proves his faith by giving a command to the children of Israel, you guys are going to move out of here. And when you move out, you're going to go back to the land God promised because God promised to give you that land. And when you go, I've given you a command, take my bones with you when you go back to the land of promise. And Joseph dies. When we end our lives, will it be that kind of faith? With those kinds of promises? You know, those words here in chapter 13, verse 19, that's actually a reference to the very last five verses of the book of Genesis. That's what's included in the last five verses of the book of Genesis. After all that has transpired over 400 years in Egypt from the days of Jacob and Joseph, now we are moving back in our text to God's action in history when Israel once again picks up traction with intensity and speed. From those words to the notice in our text, 400 years. It took 400 years to discipline Israel and prepare them to follow God. He let them live in the world for 400 years and see all the good things the world had to offer. And that's all that it has to offer. 400 years they lived there. But you know, even then, God had to drag them through 40 years of wilderness wanderings to teach them to learn to trust him. You know, if you think about it in terms of blocks of time, he then gave them times of war and peace from Joshua through the days of the judges up to King David, and that took 400 years too. He then gave them approximately another 400 years to get their act together during the horrendous days of the monarchy and the divided kingdom ending with the Assyrian captivity in 722 B.C. and then the Babylonian captivity, which was in three stages. You've heard me preach on that. 605 B.C. was the first deportation, 597 the second deportation, 586 the third deportation, and the destruction of the walls of Jerusalem. 400, 400, 400, with a 40 in the middle of all that. How many times does God have to spank his people before they learn their lesson? Or let me ask it another way. How many times does God have to spank us before we learn our lessons? I don't remember who said this, but it's a famous quote my mother often would say. The wheels of God grind slowly, but they grind exceeding fine. The wheels of God grind slowly, but they grind exceeding fine. 400, 400, 400, and a 40 in the middle of all that. Here's the passage where Joseph commanded his bones to be carried from the promised land. 
Last five verses of Genesis. And Joseph dwelt in Egypt. He and his father's house. And Joseph lived an hundred and ten years. And Joseph saw Ephraim's children of the third generation. The children also of Machir, the, child, the son of Manasseh, were brought up on Joseph's knees. And Joseph said unto his brethren, I die. And God will surely visit you and bring you out of this land unto the land which he sware to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And Joseph took an oath of the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and ye shall carry up my bones from hence. Last words of Joseph. So Joseph died, being a hundred and ten years old, and they embalmed him, and he was put in a last three words of Genesis, coffin in Egypt. Boy, doesn't that sound final. For a closing to a book that began, in the beginning, God, and it ends in a coffin in Egypt. Where has Adam's sin brought us? Nota bene, note well. So a question, did the bones of Joseph actually make it back after the 40 years of wandering, crossing the Jordan, entering the land in full battle attack? Can you imagine carrying a coffin around while you're trying to do all this stuff? As strange as it may seem to us, the Jews carried the bones of Joseph through the entire conquest of the land of Canaan. They did not bury Joseph's bones until after Joshua died and Joshua was buried. Joseph's oath ends the book of Genesis, but Joseph's burial ends the book of Joshua. Did you know that? Last five verses of Genesis, Joseph's oath. Last part of Joshua, Joseph's burial. I'm going to start with Joshua giving his final command and then Joshua's death so that you'll see how Joseph actually ends the book of Joshua too. I'm in mean, Joshua chapter 24 beginning in verse 19. And Joshua said unto the people, You cannot serve the Lord, for he is an holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions nor your sins. You get the idea of what the law is all about? The law does not justify you. The law condemns you. Your salvation and your sanctification. Justification and imputation are by grace through faith. The law only condemns. The law is to prove that you cannot be justified. You cannot have righteousness imputed to your account in the sight of a holy God. Only God can do it for you. Joshua goes on, If you forsake the Lord and serve strange gods, then he will turn and do you hurt and consume you. After that he hath done you good. And the people said unto Joshua, They've just been through the wilderness wanderings. They've just been through the conquest of the land. They're now getting settled in the land. Joshua's calling him and saying, you know, I don't think you guys are going to make it. But, but, but we're here. We got it. Everything's together. We've conquered the land. We've divided it among the tribes. We each know which cities belong to us. We know where the cities of refuge are located on each side of the Jordan River. Each one of us has got a great inheritance. We like what we got. I don't think you guys are going to make it. That's what Joshua's telling him here. The people said unto Joshua, Nay, we, but we will serve the Lord. And Joshua said unto the people, Okay, guys, ye are witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen you, the Lord, to serve him. And they said, We are witnesses. Now therefore put away, said he, the strange gods which are among you. What? You mean they still had some strange gods? That they'd been lugging around all the way through the wilderness wanderings, all the way through the conquest of the land. Even as we get to the end of the book of Joshua, they still got some strange gods? Yeah, so do we. What's in your heart? What's really in your heart? Incline your heart unto the Lord, God of Israel. And the people said unto Joshua, The Lord our God will we serve. His voice will we obey. Right. You read the next few chapters. You go on what's happened in the book of Judges. You're going to discover they talked a lot, but they didn't do a lot. 
Joshua made a covenant with the people that day and set them a statute and an ordinance in Shechem. And Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of God and took a great stone and set it up there under an oak that was by the sanctuary of the Lord. I've preached on stones of memorial on Memorial Day in the past. I hope you remember that. And Joshua said unto all the people, Behold, this stone shall be a witness unto us, for it hath heard all the words of the Lord which he spake unto us. It shall be therefore a witness unto you, lest ye deny your God. There's a marker. You have some markers in your life. There's some stones you've set up in your life that mark specific critical events in your life. So Joshua let the people depart, every man unto his own inheritance. It came to pass after these things that Joshua the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died, being an hundred and ten years old. And they buried him in the border of his inheritance in Timnat Serah, which is in Mount Ephraim, on the north side of the hill of Gaash. And Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua, and all the days of the elders that overlived Joshua and which had known all the works of the Lord that he had done for Israel. A godly man founded this church. There are those of you who have overlived the days of that godly man. We just lost an elder, 95 years old, who overlived the days of that man you know what happens after those all passed away with Israel Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders that overlived Joshua and which had known all the works of the Lord that he had done for Israel and the bones of Joseph which the children of Israel brought up out of Egypt. Now, folks, this is all the way across the Red Sea. They carried them. All the way through 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, they carried them. All the way across the Jordan River, they carried them. At the city of Jericho, they had the bones of Joseph. And the city of Ai, and all the rest of the conquest of the land, traveling all over the land, up and down, they were carrying the bones of Joseph. The bones of Joseph with the children of Israel brought up out of Egypt, buried they in Shechem, in a parcel of ground which Jacob bought of the sons of Amor, the father of Shechem, for an hundred pieces of silver, and it became the inheritance of the children of Joseph. And Eliezer, the son of Aaron, died, and they buried him in a hill that pertaineth to Phinehas, his son, which was given him in Mount Ephraim. You know, as I was typing this in preparation for this message, I began to weep. If God so took care of the bones of Joseph, I know that he will take care of me and he will take care of you. I want to read you something out of this new Acts and Facts. I hope you picked them up. Keith mentioned them this morning. Here it is. They're on the tables around the auditorium. As well as the new days of praise for September, October, and November. I was reading through this. And this really struck me as very fitting here. A lot of people want to give biblical input but they have very little biblical insight. Everybody wants to boss and push and shove and do things. They want to give input, but they don't, want to have, they don't have much insight. The Hebrews of Nehemiah's day didn't just want to hear the word. They wanted to receive it, apply it, and live it out. In fact, they called for it, Nehemiah 8.1. And it brought about conviction, verse 9. When was the last time you wept when the word of God was read? I don't watch church services on TV, but when I come across something in religious broadcasting, it seems to be comedic. They're whooping, laughing, jumping up and down, and shouting. But I can't remember the last time I've been in a service marked by people crying. 
I hear people laughing, coughing, talking, or even walking out, but not crying. In our day, the lack of conviction is very easy to see because no one weeps in church anymore. Many people cannot take the preaching of the Word of God. They can be entertained but not challenged. This is due to sin in their lives. They want to hear but not receive it. George Bernard Shaw, the great British playwright, owned a Bible. A few years before his death, he sold it to auctioneers who later sold it for $50 after he died. Shaw had written in the flyleaf of the Bible the following words. This book is the most undesirable possession. I must get rid of it. I really cannot bear it in my house. The word was too convicting to read or even have around, so he sold it. I'm afraid that many Christians in our day look for the church of the least resistance to their sins. You often see me crying in the pulpit. I can't help it. The word of God grips my soul. Does it ever grip your soul? Or do you just cry for yourself and the stuff you want? Back to the text. I want you to notice a couple of interesting things. Did you notice that both Joseph and Joshua died at the age of 110? Did you pick that up when you read those two passages? Joseph dies at 110. Joshua dies at 110. Did you notice something else? Jacob commanded Joseph with the same charge in Genesis 49, verses 29 and 30. The exact same charge that Jacob gave about his burial, not in Egypt, back in Canaan, was the exact same charge that Joseph gave to the tribes. Not in Egypt, back in Canaan. You know what was important to the father was important to the son. Things that fathers count as important make a lasting impact on the lives of their children. What was your father interested in? What was his goal in life? What were the things that he counted as important? You're going to see reflections in your life. What are the things in your life that you have chosen by the grace of God to make important because those are the things that you'll see make a lasting impact on the lives of your children what is important to you and it shows the way in which you live where you go what you do when you do it how often you do it you're training the next generation and your grandchildren too oh the impact you can have on your grandchildren I love the impact that God has let me have on my grandchildren and I see the impact that God in his mercy has made in the lives of my children. Praise God. Remember, things the fathers count as important make a lasting impact on their children. Here we find Jacob, Genesis 49. All these are the twelve tribes of Israel. And this is it that their fathers spake unto them and blessed them. Everyone according to his blessing, he blessed them. He's just gone through that whole list of the twelve tribes. And he charged them and said unto them, I am to be gathered unto my people, and others I'm going to die. Bury me with my fathers in the cave that is in the field of Ephron the Hittite, in the cave that is in the field of Machpelah, which is before Mamre, in the land of Canaan, which Abraham bought with the field of Ephron the Hittite for a possession of a burying place. There they buried Abraham and Sarah his wife, there they buried Isaac and Rebekah, his wife. There I buried Leah. Rachel, you remember, died in childbirth and was buried outside of Bethlehem. The purchase of the field and of the cave that is therein was from the children of Heth. When Jacob had made an end of commanding his sons, 
He gathered up his feet into the bed and yielded up the ghost and was gathered unto his people. Egypt is a picture and type of the world, folks. I hope you realize this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Jacob had to live in Egypt for a while. But he wanted to be buried in Canaan, the land of promise. Joseph had to live in Egypt for a while. But he wanted his final burial place to be in Canaan, the land of promise, because he believed the promises of God. He was walking by faith even though he didn't see it yet. Are you walking by faith? Joseph did exactly what his father had commanded. And as a result, he received his blessing and reward more than 400 years later. You know, you don't always know when God will send his blessing. The when is up to God. Our job is just to obey him exactly what he has told us to do and then leave the results to him. Jacob died. And Joseph, who made the command for himself, says Joseph fell upon his father's face and wept upon him and kissed him. And Joseph commanded his servants, the physicians, to embalm his father. And the physicians embalmed Israel. And 40 days were fulfilled for him. Interesting. Because we've just talked about the 40 days of bad spying, which ended in the 40 years of wilderness wanderings. No accidents in the text. For so are fulfilled the days of those which are embalmed, and the Egyptians mourn for him threescore and ten days. Well, that's 70. You know, I like to track numbers in Scripture. I don't, I don't get into the mystical stuff on that, but interesting that there was 70 days there, and then there were 70 years in captivity later on in the Babylonian captivity. And they're all tied together. Different texts tie all those passages together. And when the days of his mourning were past, Joseph spake unto the house of Pharaoh, saying, If now I have found grace in your eyes, speak, I pray you, in the ears of, ears of Pharaoh, saying, My father made me swear, saying, Lo, I die in my grave, which I have digged for me in the land of Canaan. There shalt thou bury me. Now therefore let me go up, I pray thee, and bury my father, and I will come again. And Pharaoh said, Go up and bury thy father, according as he made thee swear. And Joseph went up to bury his father, and with him went up all the servants of Pharaoh, the elders of his house, and all the elders of the land of Egypt. What a testimony, what an impact Joseph had made on these pagans. And all the house of Joseph and his brethren in his father's house, only their little ones and their flocks and their herds, they left in the land of Goshen. In the Exodus, they're going to take them with them. But then they left them there. And they went up with him, both chariots and horsemen, Oh, we see chariots and horsemen in our text too, don't we? Interesting. The first time we find the Egyptians heading that direction, it's in peace and in honor. The second time, it's in pursuit to murder the Israelites. A very great company. And they came to the threshing floor of Atad, which is beyond Jordan. And there they mourned with a great and sore lamentation, which is beyond Jordan. Israel's going to get to Jordan again someday. But it's going to be a lot harder the second time around. And there he made a mourning for his father seven days. And when the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, saw the mourning in the floor of Etad, they said, This is a grievous mourning to the Egyptians, wherefore the name of it was called Ebo Mitzrayim, the mourning of the Egyptians, which is beyond Jordan. And his sons did unto him according as he commanded them. Oh, that we might understand the parent-to-child, parent-to-child, parent-to-child relationship, passing things on. And God has built that into the Jews. You think about it, they still celebrate Passover today. 1445 B.C., date of the Exodus. 3,000, almost 500 years later. 
they're still celebrating it. Father to son, father to son, father to son, father to son. What are you passing on to your children that will last that long? For his sons carried him into the land of Canaan and buried him in the cave of the field of Machpelah, which Abraham bought with the field of possession for a bearing place of Ephraim the Hittite before Mamre. And Joseph returned into Egypt, he and his brethren and all that went up with him to bury his father after he had buried his father. I can't believe our time has gone this far. Verse 2 of chapter 14, there are three words mentioned. There are three place locations. Three names. I will tell you what they mean because they are the key to where the exodus took place. Verse 2, have you got your Bibles open? They're told to turn and encamp before Pihahirot. That's the first one, Pihahirot. That's where we get our name for the message, Mouth of the Gorges. That's what it means. Between Migdal, that word means tower and the sea, over against Baal Siphon, that means the master of the Lord of the north. Before it shall ye encamp by the sea. And Pharaoh saw where they went. And Pharaoh said, I got them in a corner. They can't get out. So where is that located? You know, we had a few place names mentioned in the text before. We saw in chapter 13, they took their journey from Sukkot, Where's that? Where's Etam? They encamped in Etam in the edge of the wilderness. You know, when we discover the meaning of those names, it helps us solve a lot of the mysteries of exactly where the crossing of the Red Sea took place. It also helps us resolve the enigmatic statement of the Apostle Paul as to the location of the real Mount Sinai in Galatians 4, 24 and 25. Have you ever paid attention to what Paul said? It says, which things are an allegory? For these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which gendereth unto bondage, which is Agar, for this agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. What? And answereth to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. Why does Paul say that Mount Sinai is in Arabia when we all know that it's in the Sinai Peninsula? Or is it? Oh, really? Does this say something about the location of Goshen? Yes. The location of Pharaoh at this time in history? Yes, because the liberals have got you started thinking a wrong date for history. They got you thinking about Ramses II a lot after the real date of the Exodus. Does it say something about the root of the Exodus? Does it say something about the immense miracle that took place at the crossing of the Red Sea? Yes, it absolutely does, and it kills the liberals' ideas. We're going to wait for next week for that. But remember... Both in ancient times and modern times, place names often describe the character, the nature, and the location of a place. So you've got those three different translations, Pihahirot, Mouth of the Gorges, Migdal, Tower, and Baal Tifon, Master of the North. So look at the descriptive words and see if you can make sense of them. It says, before Pihahirot. It says, between Migdal and the sea. It says, over against Baal Tifon. Before it, ye shall encamp. Homework for you for this coming week. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word and for its power. Very exciting. As we put together the different parts of Scripture, comparing Scripture with Scripture, what do other parts of the Old Testament say about our text? What does the New Testament say about our text? What application does the New Testament make about the wilderness wanderings of the children of Israel? Because these things were written aforetime for our learning that we through comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. But these things were also written to warn us upon whom the ends of the world are come, so that we would not fall into the same sins that Israel fell into, because people are still sinners. People still do the same stupid things. People still have the same lusts. And Father, even though you by your grace have saved us and given us your indwelling Holy Spirit, day by day we war against the flesh. Day by day we're tempted to walk in the ways of the world. Day by day, we allow the world around us to pressure us and squeeze, it, squeeze us into its own mold instead of being conformed to the image of Christ. We pray, Father, that you will take the word of God as proclaimed this day and use that which is true in the hearts and lives of each one of us so that we might be more like Jesus when we meet again. 
For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is hymn number 625, Son of My Soul. Let's stand to sing all the verses, 600.